gates of heaven Who else could make every king bow down Who else can whisper and darkness trim Splendor outshines the sun. What other majesty rings with justice? Father 
Thank you, Rami and Joy, for leading us in singing praises to God this morning in our worship service. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for our online worship service this morning. And uh, today is uh, our uh, Holy, OMS Holiness Church of North America's Founders Day. And uh, uh, today, or this year, happens to be our 100th year as a uh, denomination. And so, yes, this is our 100th anniversary year. Uh, of the OMS Holiness Church of North America. And so um, we have a lot to be thankful for, and uh, we are so grateful for God's faithfulness in the continuation of this ministry uh, that started in the LA area uh, 100 years ago and continues on uh, throughout uh, California and Hawaii and also in Arizona. So uh, this morning, as we come for our Founders Day, uh, as we do have been doing every Sunday, we want to declare our faith in God through the reciting of the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's continue our worship service with prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you praise. You are a faithful God, and we especially remember your faithfulness this morning as we think of the 100th year anniversary of the Ole Miss Holiness Church of North America. Through these hundred years, Lord, you have seen through the ministry of our conference, and you have brought many people unto yourself through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you that that ministry continues on through the various churches, Lord, here in California, in Hawaii, and also in Arizona. Father, that you will continue to guide and direct us that, Lord, that your name will be exalted in each of the local churches. And, uh, Lord, that we would rely on your Holy Spirit's work so that in everything you would receive the praise and glory. That everything will be recognized as that is that from you, Lord. And that's the same thing we pray for our own worship service and our ministry here in San Diego, Lord. For the outpouring of your Holy Spirit to empower us, to guide us that we might truly worship you in spirit and in truth. So we thank you for this morning. We ask for your continual uh, healing for people. We ask for your comfort upon those who need comfort. And we ask, Lord, that people will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We know that salvation is from you and you alone, that there is no other name by which man can be saved, but only through Jesus Christ. And thank you, Lord, uh, for jesus who you sent out of your love who lived the perfect life in going to the cross to die for our sins and we thank you through the resurrection that we have the hope of eternal life help us to declare the good news of jesus and help us to uh, uh, continue to worship you and continue to fellowship you and continue to do the things that you call us to as a as a as a church body as a family of god Help us, Lord, we pray. We entrust the rest of this service into your care and pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This morning's children's message will be given by Unike, and uh, she'll be sharing some things regarding Founders Days with us. I hope you enjoy the children's message. Hello! The fourth Sunday in April is the Holiness Conference's Founders Day. So today, I would like to share with you one of my favorite missionary stories. 
The San Diego Japanese Christian Church is a part of the OMS Holiness Church of North America. Originally, OMS meant Oriental Missionary Society, but now it is called One Mission Society. About a hundred years ago, the OMS gospel workers and other believers, even here in America, were inspired by God to share the good news of Jesus Christ to every household in Japan. It was called the Great Village Campaign. Can you imagine? It is like reaching every person in California with a gospel message. Letty Kalman, one of the founding missionaries of OMS, tells of how for five years, a hundred faithful evangelists traveled from village to village, from morning to night, in the name of Jesus, with the word of God, and with Christian literature to share. Using the Japanese government's military maps, which were providentially made public, they reached the remotest homes, even on top of a mountain. It is miraculous that by 1918, these dedicated messengers visited over 10 million homes and reached out to over 50 million people. But that's not all. Some of these gospel workers extended their work to Korea and to China and to share God's wonderful message of His love, forgiveness, and eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. Acts 16.31 says, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Praise God that his wonderful work continues to this day. Reverend Okuda's father was a pastor of a holiness church in Korea, and his mother served God faithfully with the holiness conference in Japan. Before she was married, Pastor Okuda's mother ministered at the main holiness church Chuo Kyokai, and it was the same church where Pastor Ichibe and his family attended when they lived in Tokyo when he was in the third grade to the sixth grade. Also, Mika Okura's father and mother dedicated their lives to pastoring a holiness church in Japan for these past 50 years or so. Romans 10. 8 through 15. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches, for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. When we think about missionaries, we may think of people who travel to distant lands, but we can start where we are right now. 
as the Holy Spirit helps us to believe in Jesus, He will help us to share His word of life and our testimonies of what God has been doing in our lives. We can share with those who are in our homes and even share a gospel tract with those who come to our homes, like the people who deliver our packages or food to our doors. We can also support God's work through prayer, with our donations, by sending an encouraging note to our missionaries or to our retired pastors, and in so many other ways. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us and for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, as our Savior from our sins, so we may receive your forgiveness and enjoy a right relationship with you and with others. Lord Jesus, you are the founder, the chief cornerstone and head of the church. Thank you for your wonderful work throughout the generations and for all of the spirit-filled gospel workers in the past, present, and future. May many more people, both young and old, near and far, become a part of your family and be empowered for the furtherance of your holy kingdom. In Jesus' great name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Unique, for today's children's message. I greatly appreciate you sharing with us uh, some things pertaining to our Founders Day. Uh, as we continue on with our worship service and uh, in, in our message for this morning, let's, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you. We ask that you will be the one who speaks to us, that you would give us understanding by your Holy Spirit. It is your word that we want to uh, listen to and heed. So please speak to us and please continue to do your good work in us as we uh, listen, as we heed, as we live out uh, your commandments for us in our lives. May all be done to your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today being Founders Day, I thought it would be appropriate to begin my message by talking about the close fellowship that the founding members of the Ole Miss Holiness Church of North America experienced. The following is what Reverend Ugo Nakata described of the young people who became the founding members of our denomination. Just as a side note, Reverend Ugo Nakata is the son of Reverend Juji Nakata, who started the holiness movement in Japan, uh, along with the Kilborns and the Kalmans, and, and, and also starting what is now known as the OMS, it's called the One Mission Society now, but it used to be called the Oriental Missionary Society. So this is what Reverend Ugo Nakata noted about the early uh, members of our conference. Each Sunday after the worship service, several young people stayed at the church and ate together. They were Henry Sakuma, Goichi Okamoto, Hatsuyano, and George Yahiro, who came to the church as a friend of Hatsuyano. By the way, uh, George Yahiro, the Reverend George Yahiro, uh, we all know because he was a pastor at our church and we even have a hall named after him uh, in our church building. And his wife was uh, eventually Hatsuyano married Reverend George uh, Yahiro. And so um, Mrs. Um, uh, Yahiro, Hatsu Yahiro is mentioned here as well. Uh, since the summer of 1920, I had been living in the church and they eventually began to visit me not only on Sundays, but also on weekdays. We prayed, discussed the faith, sang together, and studied the Bible. Throughout these activities, they were full of fire and courage. It was a small revival during which some repented of their sins and some experienced the grace of holiness. They all committed their lives unto the Lord through their revival experience. Goichi Okamoto was saved, Henry Sakuma decided to become a minister, and George Yahiro experienced the grace of God. Lying on the floor, they prayed and shed copious tears. 
They were transformed in the same way as were the disciples who experienced Pentecost 2,000 years ago. Reverend Sadaichi Kuzuhara, the first minister of our denomination, noted how these same young people experienced God's power in a manner reminiscent of the first believers on the day of Pentecost. He wrote, That day I was very discouraged by my powerless message at the special meeting. Not knowing what to do, I decided to pray until I received power from above. Nine church members came to the year-end prayer meeting on December 31st, 1922. They were all dedicated Christians seeking the Lord from the bottom of their hearts. They joined me and we all prayed together. Although we started to pray, one by one we soon felt heavy, thick clouds over us. Suddenly we felt the presence of Jesus as if he were on his way to Emmaus when he opened his disciples' spiritual eyes. We believed that the same God could do the same thing and open our eyes that day. Encouraged by the story of Emmaus, we started to pray earnestly. The presence of Jesus was so close to us at that time that we all felt the power from above. Suddenly, we all prayed at once, not waiting for each other's prayers. We prayed as if something had happened to us. One kept crying, holding a handkerchief to his face. Another was screaming in prayer, knowing his powerlessness as a Christian. That was the beginning of the revival in the Holiness Church. What we see from the way our denomination started is the close-knit fellowship of the church members being together in prayer, repenting, and seeking the filling of the Holy Spirit. Such fellowship is what we should desire as well. And it is important for us to not neglect coming together for such times. As we look at the importance of coming together for fellowship this morning, let us look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Verse 23 calls into account our hope in God. So what is our hope in God? What are we to hold fast to and without wavering? Our hope is in the fact that as indicated in the verses preceding this, Jesus' perfect atoning sacrifice allows us to draw near to God, holy made new and righteous before God. In verses 19 to 22, it says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Because of Jesus' perfect work of bringing about our salvation as the perfect sacrifice and perfect priest, we are exhorted to draw near together before God in faith. Thus we are exhorted to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. We can hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering because our hope or truth of the fact of Jesus' perfect and finished work of salvation is based on His faithfulness. All the promises of God are secure because God is faithful. The Greek word translated without wavering is used only here in the New Testament and is based on the idea of an upright object not inclining at all from the true perpendicular. There is no place in the Christian experience for a hope 
that is firm at one time and shaky at another. Our hope in God should be immovable as God himself cannot be moved from his sovereign position. Based on this, we are also exhorted to consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not only are we to be mindful of what Jesus has done for us and live accordingly, but we are also to be mindful of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to prayerfully and thoughtfully consider how to stimulate or spur on one another to love and good deeds. We ought to consider one another, that is, to know one another, to be interested in one another, to be ready to serve one another, but especially to be interested in the spiritual well-being and growth of those who are united to us in the Christian fellowship. We should give more thought to our oneness in Christ. The hope of Christ in us urges us to care for one another. It seems that this admonition to love one another, our social obligation, was also necessary since some were abandoning the faith. The readers needed to stimulate one another to remain faithful to the Lord. This type of love is the product of communal activity. We cannot practice it in isolation from other believers. Apparently, discouragement made them avoid community at the very time they needed it most. The wording of stimulate or spur on or stir up is strong. The term means incitement and is either used as here in a good sense or as in Acts 15.39 in a bad sense, such as contention. It seems to suggest that loving one another will not just happen, especially as the love talked about here is the ancient Greek word agape, which is unconditional love. Faith and hope can be practiced alone in isolation, in a hermit's cell or on a desert island. However, the exercise of love is possible only in community. We see that such stimulation and interaction was much needed because some were apparently forsaking assembling together. To be honest, we are doing the same today because of the coronavirus pandemic. I am not going to lay blame on anyone else in regards to this matter, but upon myself as the pastor. This should never have happened, at least not for this long a period of time. Because of this, I believe many of you have suffered in your faith and spiritual life. Thus, we need to stop this habit of forsaking assembling together and get back to coming together for worship and fellowship so that we can encourage one another in our faith and to love as Jesus does and to do good deeds in the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to continually come together for worship and fellowship and ministry and prayer. We are not to get into the habit of not doing so. Rather, we are to come together to encourage one another, and we are to do so all the more as we see the day of Jesus' return drawing closer. We need each other, and we need to come together to encourage one another. Our motivation for gathering together for fellowship must be to obey God and to give to others. Because it is so important that Christians gather together, things that work against their gathering must be regarded as serious dangers. The writer of Hebrew was urging mutual accountability since we will have to give an account of ourselves to God. The day drawing near is the day we will give an account of ourselves to God. This may have been an allusion to the destruction of Jerusalem AD 70 for the original readers, but it is definitely an allusion to the judgment seat of Christ for us. I like to consider fellowship as being in the same boat together. We are fellow travelers in the same ship, saved from God's judgment through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is like Noah's ark in terms of delivering us from God's judgment 
in bringing about our salvation. As fellow travelers in Christ, we need to support each other, work together, and encourage one another to love and good deeds. We are saved already, but the journey is not over yet. And there are plenty of rough times along our journey together that demands our attention and affection towards one another. In the Hebrews 10, 23-25 passage, we are looking at this morning, the word fellowship is not used. However, we are exhorted to assemble together or meet together for the purpose of encouraging one another. Most likely, gathering together regularly for worship of God is in mind here. But it is in this context that we enjoy fellowship with God and one another. Ultimately, the fellowship we share with one another in Christ is closely tied to our fellowship with God, and we need to be mindful of our relationship with God and the family of God. The Apostle John wrote concerning this sweet fellowship in this manner in 1 John chapter 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you, that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. We must always remember Jesus' perfect work of salvation. This is the reason why we can have fellowship with one another, and the reason why we should have fellowship with one another. The word for fellowship used here is the Greek word koinonia. The word means to share in and has the connotation of participation. In other words, fellowship is active and participatory, where we share in the blessings of salvation in Christ Jesus together. We actively pursue ways to stimulate one another to love and good deeds and thus encourage one another in living out our faith. As I look into my cell phone, which I am using to record this message, I cannot help but yearn for the opportunity to be together with all of you, to worship the Lord together in person. At certain points during this time of isolation and staying at home for online worship services, I must admit that it has become routine and somewhat comfortable. Comfortable because I don't need to go anywhere. Yet I was convicted just last week in preparation for the Joint Deacons meeting and particularly in preparing for a discussion on the possibility of reopening our church facility for in-person worship services, that the real issue was not the coronavirus. The real issue within myself could be defined by one word, trust. Do I truly trust God? Do I truly trust Him to be sovereign and good? Do I trust Him more than science and medicine? Also, do I trust the people around me, and particularly you, the church family? Do I trust that you are doing your best every day to remain healthy and well? Do I trust that when you come to church gatherings, that you come with no ill intent and definitely not to cause other people to become sick? If I truly trust God and trust you, my church family, then I should have no problem whatsoever coming together with you in in-person 
for worship services or any other gatherings in the name of Christ Jesus. Our trust is not in the government, nor in a vaccine, nor our own precautionary measures to not get sick and protect our families. Our trust is in God, and at least for me, this has been the number one thing that has been challenged due to this coronavirus pandemic. I have to ask myself, what am I afraid of? Especially knowing that God is with me. Sure, I have been praying that none of us get sick with this virus. I have prayed not so much that I would not get sick, but rather that no one will get sick because of me. Yet the reality is that it is better to get sick with the coronavirus and have eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ than to be free from all sicknesses and be oblivious to the deadliest heart condition called sin in one's life and not know the remedy for it. To the extent that I am worried about the physical health of people more than the spiritual health of people shows the deceptive and deathly nature of the time which we are living in. The Apostle Paul wrote to the believers in Rome, the capital city of a pagan and evil empire, where Christians were eaten alive by lions in the Colosseum for entertainment and were also used as human torches to light the streets at night. Paul wrote, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you have somehow lost trust in God during this time, as I believe many have, then let's seek God's forgiveness and mercy and repent of our wrong, wrongful thinking. God alone saves and God alone heals. Yes, he may heal through doctors and medical care, but ultimately healing is in his hands. As Job declared in the midst of his suffering, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God holds our very existence in his hands. Jesus put it this way, Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Furthermore, he said, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life's Span. In other words, God takes good care of us, and as a bird does not fall to the ground without God's knowing, we will not pass away without God's will in the matter. I am not saying live carelessly and care or carefree. I am saying let us live with confidence in God's care and will for us without fear of any other thing. Our faith in Jesus Christ makes us fearless. Because he has conquered sin and death, and he has saved us. Being the church means we affirm these things and encourage one another in living out our faith in Christ. On this Founders Day, let us remember how the young people 100 years ago came together for fervent prayer and the filling of the Holy Spirit 
recognizing their spiritual weakness and utter powerlessness without their fellowship with God and each other. We need to come together to fellowship with one another. We need to stop forsaking our own assembling together so that we can be together to encourage one another and stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Now, how did we practice this? I believe that in-person gatherings are ideal. And some of you feel comfortable with it, and some of you do not. I'm not here to uh, bring about judgment on anyone on these matters. But I, I did share with you just my own uh, struggles with what's going on. And if it's an issue of trust or faith in God, then I, I bring that challenge before you to examine yourself regards to this matter. What is it that is causing us to not want to or to refrain from in-person gathering? Yes, I know you could say we want to be a submissive and obedient to a governmental authorities and these regulations. And um, I agree with you on that. But to the extent that some things are opening up and some things are allowed, for instance, like uh, meeting together outside is allowed. Uh, why won't we do this? Is it the regulations or breaking the regulations that we are afraid of? Or is it um, our own health or the health of others uh, that is of main concern? We need to really examine ourselves on this matter. So uh, that's my exhortation to examine yourself. But at the same time, let us consider how to stimulate one another onto love and good deeds. Let us consider one another. How do we do this if not in person? And we have tried to do things online. There have been remote ministries. Uh, this online worship service, as you are watching, is one of those means. But still, we're not together. Uh, I'm not sure if we're even watching this at the same time on Sunday mornings. But online uh, is okay. Um, and to the extent of those who come to the live um, gatherings, when I mean live uh, Bible studies, um, prayer meetings, um, after worship, hangout times, uh, those times we are able to have some interaction and we're able to so-called see one another even if we're not uh, able to be uh, together but uh, those are great opportunities given the circumstances that we have yes but if you're not involved with either of those things then i need you to prayerfully consider how you might be in fellowship with other believers. Again, with the online, maybe you just don't like online meetings, and I understand that. Or maybe you don't know how to go on to these online meetings. If that is the case, please contact me. I would love to help you out so that you can join in on these live online uh, meetings. But if it's you just are tired of it, or you're just forget it altogether mentality, I exhort you, encourage you uh, not to give up. And we need, again, that's the exhortation here. We need one another. We need to encourage one another so that we might be strengthened, so that we can remember the agape love of God and we ourselves can live that out in our lives and to do good deeds. I love you, brothers and sisters in Christ. And I am concerned about our spiritual well-being. And therefore, I really want to encourage you to consider how to stimulate one another onto love and good deeds. And let us not forsake gathering together. Let us get together and um, encourage one another and continue to grow in our faith in Jesus Christ so that others may come to know him as well. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your love for us. The very fact that we're uh, having this worship service is only because of your Son, Jesus Christ. That Jesus came to save us. And his, perfect, and his work was perfect. And we are so grateful. We recognize that we're not perfect. And we need you so desperately in our lives. 
but you have called us to be a family. You have called us to be a body. And as Jesus is the head, each of us has different responsibilities. We are part of the body. But if we don't function together, if we don't come together, if we don't encourage one another, if we're not praying for each other, uh, that's a problem. And Lord, we pray that we will be able to come together again, Lord, to be together again, that we might be able to encourage one another to be built up as a body of Christ, to be truly a loving family of God, ministering to one another and doing ministry together so that the world may know you. We humbly pray for these things. And thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let us conclude today's worship service with our song of response and then with closing Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.